Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are. Shalom, and welcome to Maka Fleischer. Hey, Ishai. God bless you, Maka, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, Malka, uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in this world. No. Yeah. First thing's going on. Just, just sitting here twiddling our thumbs. Yeah, not exactly. And I want to say to you that uh, one of the big issues right now is that uh, Israel inadvertently killed like seven humanitarian workers. Right. So a few comments on that. First thing is the new effort to stymie the war. Mm-hmm in Gaza is to flood it with like so-called human rights workers, okay? Like you make it like all about human rights workers, you make it all about um, uh, parachuting the food to people, you basically keep the people in place, you're filled with all these folks that are non-combatants and then you can't operate a war. So the new way to keep everybody from going is to feed them from the air and to flood the place with uh, supposed non-combatants. Stuff is starting to come out about seven of these the, these seven people that were killed. Three of them seems like, at first reports, are British mercenaries who uh, worked for some kind of specialist security force that were basically ferrying uh, around Arabs with security. We don't know what yet, but they're certainly not world kitchen worker workers. Oh. Okay? And there's something different, okay? so So they're starting to be... Uh, identified as 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 what they are, which is probably militants of some kind. Wow. You know, mercenary militants from, from England. So that's that's number one. That was what I just said is unconfirmed, but it's starting to trickle out as we speak. So that's number one. But the point is, is that like, you know, they're trying to, 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 to slow us down. And then when Israel strikes at, uh, uh, you know, inadvertent targets, then then the whole world comes out against us. The Pope came out against and and certainly jill biden is like stop the war i told i told him joe 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 stop the war okay so so there's this whole effort now to slow down the war which we foresaw in the beginning which is if you don't strike fast and hard the so-called world or at least the part of the world that is against israel that is sometimes calls itself the world is trying to to slow us down here in this conflict Uh, they want us to not beat hamas they want hamas to declare victory at the end I'm, I get tired of the, like, televisedness of this war. Do you know what I'm talking about? The revolution will it's, be televised. Yes, this revolution will be televised. I think that it's a very weird way to be fighting a war that, like, you do stuff, and then it's on TV, and then there's commentators, and it's all in the news, and then they do stuff, and it's on TV, and the commentators. It's just like, it's like, it's like the Super Bowl. It's like, it's like commercial break, Israel. And I'm just, I'm just a little tired sometimes of us being so in the crosshairs of the international media. Mm. Not so much like I understand that that uh, you know world governments think that they have the right to tell us what to do all the time. But now it's like also international media that thinks it has the right to That's tell right. us what to do all That's the time. Right. And so, uh, speaking of international media, my YouTube channel, I'll be covering the Pope's uh, Easter Mass, uh, basically telling Israel to cease fire and let Hamas win. Uh, this war so check out uh, Yishai Fleischer TV at YouTube uh, another speaking of that um, our very own uh, minister that lives in these parts Itamar Ben Gvir uh, was the target of a planned assassination wow. attempt was a target well like they w- tried to shoot him no, or they were gonna try they to were shoot gonna him. shoot him the, the Shabak yeah. wow. the the Israel's FBI arrested 11 <sighs> uh, Arabs in the Negev in the in southern wow. Israel regular Israel and a few from Judea and Samaria and basically, they were going to act like regular merchants and shoot Ben Gvir with an RPG in Kiryat Arba. What? Yes. They also wanted to- How are to- they going to act like reg- regular merchants and shoot an RPG in Kiryat Arba? What's the big deal? Just are you saying ar- that Arab merchants are working in Kiryat Arba? Yeah, next to it. Yeah. Next next to it. There's oh, like, and like stores. Oh, and Yeah. And there's this car was going to drive out. Holy cow. They were going to shoot gonna an RPG. And they were going to blow up his car. Yeah. That's right. So, wow. and they caught them. These guys also wanted to uh, create a, create a factory for armament and 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 the uh, small arms. Wow, so industrious. Quite, quite. Uh, and also, uh, they the they caught ISIS terrorists. Yep. Who wanted to create a bomb at Teddy Teddy Stadium and set it off when a goal would be scored, so then people wouldn't understand exactly what happened. Holy cow. They, they got to that level of confession from them. Wow. Uh, I, I just want to say that our daughter's school is not far from Teddy Stadium. 
and and this this stuff is real real if we don't understand what the jihad is and what it wants from us and it's in the negev it's in judea and samaria it's in jerusalem and eastern jerusalem it's all over the place go ahead i just want to say that for years and years the security apparatus has treated our enemies like they're a bunch of like stone throwing neanderthals right unsophisticated clumsy cheap right and I pray to God that everybody can understand now that our enemies are not clumsy Neanderthals. Right. They are bad faith, sophisticated, like militia people, and they are trying to destroy this country. Right. And destroy us as people. And they will do it either through public diplomacy or through conventional diplomacy. They will do it through uh, through a religious diplomacy. They'll do it through... Uh, through armed uh, struggle, they will do it through uh, through everything that they can do it through through journalism, through governments, through boycotts, through whatever it is. Certainly through um, brainwashing students on campuses. And I really hope that we will like get with the program. I really hope that we will wake up and realize that the the all the preconceptions that we that we and when i say we i mean we as a as a one group you know obviously there are there are many of us who have been talking about this for years and years and years that there are entities that are trying to destroy israel from within and without um and now i hope that the rest of the country is catching up with this piece of information um, but it's re- it's a real battle out here. I got to tell you guys, you know, there is there is a major battle to not go back to the life that we were living right. on October 6th to not you. You would be shocked, listeners. You would be shocked at how many religious Zionist towns in Judea and Samaria and the rest of Israel, but especially in Judea and Samaria, hire local Arab labor on a regular basis as opposed to Jewish labor. Today, today. Yes. I uh was coming out of uh the 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 your, prayer your, house. Your shul, yeah. And there was an Arab worker of our town, a young one, laying back, not working, and listening to Quran verses very loud. Like on, on his phone. phone, right? Just sitting in our cent- in our like shopping center and just loudly now i have no problem with taking a break but i you know but i have a problem with a guy who's like does not seem to be working hard laying back in the middle of our thing like have no honor and respect for his job and listening to loud quranic verses and which I, I, which like that may be his belief system but let's not pretend that he doesn't understand right the impact of right. putting that on his speakerphone Right. It would be like me going into Ramallah and listening to like Megillat Esther on speakerphone. <laughs> Very good. Okay? You should do it's that. It's like you should it's do like that. it's it's my religion and it is my faith and it is my life and it is what I really believe and it is my right. But like I'm you shouldn't be blind to the fact that you are doing something specific and my guess is that he was doing it intentionally as a way of showing his um, little war. His, it's a little war against no, his like power. Right. Like no one's going to stop him. We're going to respect his religious faith. We're going to respect his rights. We're meek. We're nonviolent. We're, you know, we need his labor. So we're going to just be quiet about it. And nice little ladies who are not, you know, edgy and hardcore who just came to buy some milk are going to walk around him and not, you know, say anything because they're afraid of him. Uh, but you did say something. I did, and I caught it all on video, and I sent it to the to the town, and uh, and okay, made us think about it, and I hope that it's going to move the dial a little bit. But people, you're right, La- Malka, Laz, our daughter. I sometimes get confused because of two awesome ladies in my life. Uh, you're right, uh, delightful Malka, that um, we have a bourgeois, we have a bourgeois side. A person who's not bourgeois is Minister Ben Kvir. He uh, was targeted for this for this attack. It didn't it didn't happen. Thank God, our, our Shabbat caught it. I did speak with. Uh, the Israel guys about Minister Ben Gvir. It's on my YouTube channel. I wanted to play here the discussion and a little. You'll hear a little preamble of what this discussion does not include. But here's my take on the story of Minister Ben Gvir and, and why he's being Itamar Ben Gvir, why he's being maligned by international media. 
The following interview that I did with Josh Waller on the Israel Guys was filmed before October the 7th. It's about Itamar ben and about his policies for national strength and against jihadism, and it was filmed before that horrific attack. So the points here are all right. In fact, they're even righter, uh, even more proven than people understood beforehand. But don't be surprised if you don't hear me mention the horrific attack of October the 7th, because it didn't happen yet when I filmed this video. But the point is, this stuff makes sense. Uh, this is the policy moving forward, the smart policy to keep Israel safe. God bless you guys, and here we go. Uh, Itamar ben is actually, he's a very controversial figure. Yes. But his stances are anything but controversial. No. It's just that he's been framed as controversial mm. by people who don't want to see, as you said, strong Jews, a strong Israel. Uh, he's very clear. He thinks this is A, the Jewish land, and that we shouldn't let terrorism run amok. We are going to now be post-Holocaust. We're not going to allow that to happen again. We're not subject to that. Right. We're yeah. going to defend ourselves this time. Yeah. We're going to stop that kind of that kind of uh, terrorism from 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 hurting us too much. Hi guys, I'm here with a really good friend, Yishai Fleischer. We've had the great honor of doing a lot of uh, great projects together. Uh, Yishai is the international spokesperson for Hebron, as well as the advisor. I say as well as the advisor to Ben Gavir. Maybe that should have been first. That's like the seemingly big job that you do. It's like uh, advisor to Ben Gavir is actually a pretty serious position. Zionist people, people that really appreciate a strong Israel, appreciate uh, Jews strong in their homeland, are actually real friends of Itamar Ben Gavir. Uh, people that are on the sidelines of that, um, those that are a little bit like not so sure that they uh, want to see Jews in Judea and Samaria, not so sure they want to see Jews defending themselves, um, are a little bit uh, on the sidelines. Of, is Hitzmar ben Gavir, is he a little bit too radical? Is he being a little too Caleb-like uh, down, down in these regions? Uh, maybe, maybe this is uh, you know, bringing a, a biblical uh, character in, in for a uh, little more political modern times, but uh, being an advisor to Itamar ben Gavir. Describe your job there, and then we'll talk a little bit more in depth about some of the things uh, that we're seeing today. Well, first thing is, is that the story of Caleb and the spies is a political story. Sure. It's a biblical story, but it's a biblical story about Jewish politics and, yeah. and, and dealing with dissenters and, and fearful people and people yeah. that were against. Remember, Joshua and Caleb were seen as bad by the other spies, and they were, they were, they were, uh, they were besmirched along with the land of Israel, and they almost killed them. It says the the verse says that they that they prepared rocks to to they almost stone them to death. So so th you know. Oh, so you're saying there may be some more, more similarities. Maybe the Bible's there to teach us about real things. Wow. And about real politics. It's certainly for us, especially the book of uh, so-called Numbers. I don't like that name. We call it in the desert. Right. The the book of Numbers is a book of Jewish politics. It's a book of issues, yeah. political issues. Uh, Itamar Ben Gvir is actually, he's a very controversial figure. Yes. But his stances are anything but controversial. No. It's just that he's been framed as controversial mm. by people who don't want to see, as you said, strong Jews, a strong Israel. Uh, he's very clear. He thinks this is A, the Jewish land, and that we shouldn't let terrorism run amok. His main thing is personal security. Yeah. His main thing is that he's the law and order guy. His main thing is terrorists in jails should not be living in a Hilton. Okay, they should, they should not be, and they certainly shouldn't be calling out for more terrorism. You murdered a Jew, you should not be like living the good life. Right. So that's one. Uh, the other thing is personal security. Israelis should be armed. If there's terrorism, terrorists who are armed, Israelis should be armed. Jews should be armed. So these are like very plain and simple things that he's asked for. And he actually uh, went out on a real political limb, and what he wanted to do was to be the Minister of National Security, which is really another name for Minister of Police, and that is one of the hardest, thought of as one of the worst ministries in the government, because the police, as the police are in many countries around the world, it's, it's an it's a unruly lot, uh, sometimes corrupt, sometimes problematic, and he wanted to get in there. He told his voters, I'm here to help you. I said to him, at the time where he was uh, negotiating for which ministry, I said to him, maybe take a smaller ministry, like a tourism ministry, and later on become th this ministry. He's like, no. What are we doing? He's like, I ran on this platform. My platform that I ran on is personal security. Post-Holocaust, 
We're not going to allow that to happen again. We're not subject to that. Right. We're yeah. going to defend ourselves this time. Yeah. We're going to stop that kind of that kind of uh, terrorism from 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 hurting us too much. So what I find really interesting is is that uh, I meant what, by too much yeah. is that if there's a terrorist attacker, okay, maybe he got a round off, but that's the end of that. And then and then if he got away, we're going to find him. Right. We're going to hunt we'll him, him down. He's done. And they know that. I mean, just that, just that Israel can hunt down terrorists. Think about it. It's a tiny Jewish state. We have, we have 7 million Jews amongst a region of 400 million Arabs. And we are an armed ethnic minority. By the way, I just want to say that that phrase that I just said, yeah. an armed ethnic minority, that's a very important phrase that a lot of people just don't understand. Right. Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people who are an armed ethnic minority in the region. Say it that way, you'll understand what we're talking about here. Yeah. Say it that we're Jewish and democratic and all these kind of things that confuses everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Just say the truth. We're an armed ethnic minority like the Kurds, mm -hmm. like the Kurds. We're out here defending ourselves from a majority, wow. part of which is jihadist. Yeah. Okay, that's what it's about. So everything you talked about so far, I'm pretty sure most people in the uh, anti-Ben Gavir camp would agree with. That's right, right? Uh, most people are for approach. They're not going to say they're, they're for weakening Israel. They're not for weak Israel. They would agree on most of these main topics, but I think uh, they've demonized Ben Gavir on issues that Ben Gavir is not really about. Is that correct? They've taken subjects that Ben Gavir is not actually his main line. Uh, for say, many people think that Ben Gavir hates Christians uh, and like, but Ben Gavir doesn't do a lot with Christians. That's not his main. Uh, his main thing is the things that you outlined. So his main objective is not uh, to. Uh, he doesn't talk about Christians. He doesn't know a lot about this. This uh, you know Christian Zionism, these kind of things. So uh, I think there's been a few things that have happened along the way that uh, news outlets took a big jump on. Uh, ben Gavir uh, for maybe a, a few specific stories uh, where Ben Gavir uh, worked on a case uh, for some people, but that's what lawyers do. Lawyers represent whoever pays them. That's what law firms do, and they have to represent these people. So would you say anything to just that? I want to clear that up with the channel. We have a lot of Christian listeners. Most of them think that it, it, Itamar Ben Gavir it really hates them. Do um, uh, you have any words to say about that? Just to clarify that point, as an advisor to it, Itamar Ben Gavir, you know him well, you know his policies, you know what he's about. Uh, maybe just a cl uh, clarification on some of those uh, things for our Christian folks. These are important questions. Uh, Israel, as I said before, is a minority, an ethnic minority in this region. Within that ethnic minority are other minorities. Yeah. Okay, Christian Arabs, uh, Druze, yeah. Cherkessi, all kinds of minorities. Uh, that, that are out here. Itamar ben -Gvir is not concerned so much with religious questions. Right. He's concerned with law and order. Right. Law and order. Yeah. And he is not interested in seeing anybody out of line or anybody right. striking at uh, 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 residents, citizens, visitors. Yeah. He wants to see law and order. He wants to see the end of a uh, kind of um, you know Wild West mentality where, where, where jihadists are... are are gathering weapons. There's about 400,000, our police estimates about 400,000 weapons, illegal weapons, in the hands of Israeli Arabs. Uh, Israeli Arabs. Israeli Arabs. <laughs> Israeli Arabs. Wow. Uh, not to mention Judea and Samaria. Now with regard, but, but I want to I wanna, I wanna touch your question. Nobody here wants to see any violence against Christians, against any minorities that come here. That is, that is simply, it's against the law. It's against the Jewish law. Uh, and it's against the interests because we are not interested in destabilization. Right. You're right that he's not the champion of uh, Christian Zionism or, or any, that's not him at all. Right. You're right. He is here to help the average Israeli Jewish citizen feel, uh, uh, feel safe and, 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 and have their, their, their safety back. Oh, and there's another big issue, which is protection rackets. Protection rackets. Arabs and Bedouins run these mafia-style protection rackets right. throughout the South. Uh, and the North, and so and so, making laws that make protection rackets more illegal, more more, more criminalized, uh, and making sure that, the, that there's going to be prosecution of these kind of people. That's what he's about. That's what he promised his voters. Yeah. Okay, uh, but at the same time, I want to tell you, it's not in his heart so much to to think about the the life of pro-Israel Arabs or pro-Israel Christians. That's not what he's about, and that's not whose voter base is. Yeah. But when a Bedouin soldier uh, was killed in a terrorist attack. He came to that family yeah. Yeah. and he made sure to give them respect and honor. And there's a great video of him talking. And the same thing with, with Christian folks. He has made it clear. He is here to protect the people. Israel's best politicians, right. Bible-based. What? Everybody that's listening is like, wait, Ben Gavir's Bible-based? 
He's the most Bible-based politician in the whole crew. One of the what most, right? The H- hardcore Bible-based. So we need more Bible-based politicians, and Ben Gavir is a great one. A few things about what you're saying. Uh, first thing is that you use the word extreme and hardcore in a positive sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> and a lot of people today but, have been used to this, this idea that these are bad words. <laughs> right, hardcore is like, like, yeah. like hard oh, line. Right. right. That's actually a good thing. <laughs> like, 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 I hardcore love my country. I hardcore <laughs> want to protect this land. I hardcore don't want to see people be hurt anymore and, and be terrorized. So just that language itself, that is very healthy to be like, no, actually, we, we are passionate about these things. Okay? Right, passionate about protecting Israel. Passionate Israel about protecting strong. Israel. And, and, I, and here, here I want to make a very important point. This is such and we'll an we'll wrap up point. at this point. Okay. When you talk about Ben Gvir, people say like, oh my God, there's like this... Uh, you know, uh, extreme minister in Netanyahu's government. Yeah. That ex- so-called extreme minister was elected by the people. <laughs> That's true. It's not that there's a guy and he showed up and here I am. It's what the people want. Yeah. The people want protection. Yeah. Regular people elected him. Right. Okay? In the, and not, by the way, just in Judea and Samaria, not just uh, very observant religious folks. Actually, people on the periphery, in the Beersheba area, in the south and the north, where they feel the brunt of the attacks on them. And so, so it's, he's a representative yeah. of, of a people's will to live in safety. Right. So don't, don't, be, don't be demonizing him. If you're going to be demonizing him, tell the truth. You're demonizing Jews that want a strong Israel. Yeah. Okay? Let's, call, let's call him for what it is. And a majority. And an elected process that yes, elected sir. him. Absolutely. It's a great point. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, here's the good news. Ben Gavir is just the beginning because the people of Israel, the demographic is changing. That's right. And that, therefore, the uh, pol- politics are changing. We're electing people that are more Bible-based. We're electing people more connected to Zionism and seeing the people settle even in Judea and Samaria and being strong. And all of these things of which Christians should be loving and upset, uh, accepting uh, that this is this is fantastic. So this is only going to continue more and more in Israel, and the world better just get used to it because politicians. This is this is a will of the people, and uh, we would like for Israel to continue to be a great democracy. All right, thank you to the Israel guys for having me on. This is an awesome show, and the show keeps going, broadcasting from the land of Israel. If you want to connect with me, it's easy enough. Uh, Yishai Fleischer uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, and my weekly podcast, the Yishai Fleischer Show. And it's God's blessings from this good land to you, wherever you are. So bless you, and thank you for being part of it. All right, thank you very much to the Israel guys, my good buddies. Uh, great job there, and thank you so much for letting me express uh, the work, the, 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 the intentions and the work of Minister Ben Gvir and uh, people that, that, that believe in Jewish rights. Right, it's not, I just want to say, like, in America, oftentimes it becomes, like, about the politician and about standing up for that person. And I just want to say that while I definitely agree, and I do think that we should stand up for uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir, who I think is like a real like um, scapegoat um, in Israeli politics, it's really much more about standing up for the principles and the ideas that people are attacking him for. That's right. Which is Jewish, healthy pride, Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, and security for all peaceful people. That's right. That's right. Malka, I want to, uh, speaking of uh, peaceful people, there's a lot of great folks that support the show. And I want to mention just a few right now, which is the good friends at prohibitionpickle.co.il. Uh, they're feeding us. Uh, they're making sure that people uh, uh, are fed, including uh, soldiers' wives and uh, lots of people that need help. And they make delicious delights. Prohibitionpickle.co.il. They're sponsors of the Ishai Fleischer Show. Our good friends. I think they're, they're turning over for Pesach pretty soon. Turning over. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Turning over for Pesach. That's such a, that's such a Jewish terminology. I love that. And the, the next thing uh, is our good friends at uh, Retro Watch Guy, making great retro wa- bringing back retro watches to the future, uh, to, to, to the present from Back to the Future? Back to I don't the Future, know. yes. Bottom line is RetroWatchGuy.com. Great watches. I wear them on Shabbat, and that makes my Shabbat retro and awesome. Because Shabbat is retro. It's Back to the Garden of Eden. So you could do that just a little bit better with RetroWatchGuy.com. Our good friends at JNS.org and JewishPress.com putting out great content uh, about Israel daily. 
information that will help you. And somebody just wrote to me the other day. Somebody wrote to me. They're like, what are the nationalist pro-Israel good news stations? And I said, there are three. JewishPress.com, JNS.org, and Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. Those are the three if, in English. If you want to get good news in English, those are the three. That's it. The other ones, don't touch yes. it. Yes. Okay. Um, so I want to thank those guys. I want to thank uh, the Jewish community of Hebron. And I was just in Hebron today, and I love Hebron so much. Thank you, Hashem, so much for helping me be connected to the tomb of the mamas and papas and the tomb of Ruth and Ishai. And so many great things are happening there, and they're great people. Today was a big Chabad day. JLI was uh, from all the world they came. It's called The Land and the Spirit. And it's really great, and I was proud to see them. Uh, so that's uh, hebronfund.org. Supports the Jewish community of Hebron. And if you want to if you wanna really touch the heart of it all, uh, go up to Jerusalem and then go up to uh, the heart of Jerusalem, the old city, and within the old city, the jewel of it all, the Temple Mount. Can you go up there? Yes. Yes, highonthehard.com will help you get to the heart of it all, the Temple Mount. Um, and finally, I want to thank, there's just one more. There's one more. Kosher Cycle Tours. Thank you so much for doing great cycle tours around this land, koshercycletours.com. Uh, Malka Fleischer, I had a chance to discuss a very important discussion yeah you mentioned america beforehand yep donald trump Mm -hmm. sat down with two important israeli reporters including my friend ariel kahana they sat down uh and did a video for uh israel hayom and i i did a commentary on that video and i think it's very instructive for people to understand how to go with people that are with us but still to touch up the right ideas phrases slogans directions that we need. So here is my discussion about the interview with Donald Trump about Israel and the future. Former U.S. President Donald Trump sat down with Israel Hayom, one of Israel's leading newspapers, for a discussion about the future of the United States and Israel. And of course, he's also a presidential hopeful. Let's uh, see what uh, Israel Hayom asked him. Our first question is whether you support Israel's goal to completely destroy Hamas. Okay, so let me just explain and why it's so sad. If I were president, you would have never been attacked because Iran was broke, they had no money. Uh, China couldn't buy oil from them because otherwise China wouldn't be able to deal with the United States. I said to China, I said to many nations, 47 nations, I spoke to many of them personally, if you buy oil from Iran, You will not do any business in the United States, and we're going to tariff your products. Every single one of them agreed. I didn't lose one, not one. And Iran did almost no oil business. You know that. Nobody would buy oil because of me. They were broke. They had no money for Hamas. They had no money for Hezbollah. They had no money for anybody. And uh, now they're sitting with $221 billion in cash, and they control Iraq, which has $300 billion in cash. It's like a subsidiary. Whether you like it or not, it's like a subsidiary because, stupidly, the United States went in and blew everything up. You know, you had two countries that were sort of equal in power, and one of them got blown up by the United States, and now uh, Iran has a big advantage in the Middle East over a lot of other countries. When I saw October 7th, it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen because there was no reason for it. They would have never, ever done that for two reasons. Number one, they were broke, and number two, I was the president. They would have never done that because they knew there would have been very big consequences. All right. That being said, Mm -hmm. uh, you have to finish up your war. You have to finish it up. You got to get it done. And uh, I'm sure you'll do that. And we got to get to peace. You can't have this going on. Uh, And I will say Israel has to be very careful because you're losing a lot of the world. You're losing a lot of support. But you have to finish up. You have to get the job done. And you have to get on to peace. You have to get on to a normal life for Israel and for everybody else. All right, so just a few comments there. First thing, very importantly, President Trump uh, makes it clear that Hamas is a subsidiary of Iran. That's very important. You're not going to hear that from the Biden administration. They're not going to say to you that the money that we transferred over to Iran had a direct impact on Hamas's attack on Israel. It's a very important thing. There's a global jihad. Iran is one of the heads of it. And Hamas is the, uh, is the actualizer of Iran's ideology. And so that's a very important point. As to the second point that President Trump said, which is that you got to finish up because you're losing a lot of uh, world support, and you got to get on with the business of peace. I don't think that's a very good winning strategy uh, when you're talking with the jihad. You have to say to them, 
I'm willing to make war for a thousand years. I'm not going to back down just because we want peace right now. We don't want peace right now. We want to do our best to go towards peace. But if you're going to make war, we're ready for war. And it's not a good negotiating tactic to say, listen, but we got to get over this war and get to peace. You've got to signal to them that you're willing to fight with them forever. It's only then that they're going to start backing down when they see that you're victorious, that you're strong, that you're not willing to just go towards peace in order to, to get to some other goal, which is, okay, you know, to get past this conflict. No, no, no. They have patience, the jihad. And you have to signal to them that you too have patience. And so I think that as a, as a negotiator, right, and a person who wrote the book on negotiation, business negotiation, deals, the art of the deal, the art of the deal is by standing strong and holding your line and not telling them that, yeah, yeah, we want to get past the war and into peace. Because then they understand that that peace is very expensive and that they're willing to milk it. The whole jihad is willing to milk us because we want to get to this other point. So I don't think it's a good negotiating strategy. That's my comment there. So so if you reelect in, in a few months as one, once again to be the president and Israel still may be in a war, how would you help Israel? Well, look, uh, there has been no president better to Israel than me. Iran wanted to make a deal. And with the deal... 90% of the deal that I want to make is no nuclear weapon. That's 90%, almost 100%. It might be 100%. That's all I want. No nuclear weapon for Iran. And it's so sad when I see what's happening in Israel and Ukraine and other places, many other places. Inflation, uh, you take a look at inflation. We wouldn't have had inflation that was caused by a stupid energy uh, policies. And uh, it's too bad he's the worst president in the history of our country. I'm a very loyal person. I've been loyal to Israel. I, look, I've been the best president in history by a factor of 10 to Israel because of all the things I do. The embassy, uh, Jerusalem being the capital, the best location for the embassy, and getting the embassy built. But then you have Abraham Hammercourts, and then you have Golan Heights. Nobody even thought that was going to be possible. I did that. I'd like to pause the president here for a second because he, he talked about the Golan Heights. Remember, Israel already recognized the Golan Heights as part of Israel. Uh, the international community hadn't. The United States hadn't. And when President Trump recognized it, that was a great thing. But just to make it clear, it's something that we already did. Israel already recognized the Golan Heights as part of Israel. So, you know, welcome to reality. Uh, but when it comes to the Abraham Accords, well, that was something. And I think that President Trump and his team deserve the Nobel Peace Prize for uh, the Abraham Accords, which was a window into how things could be, how things should be in this region, which is a strong Israel surrounded by strong Arab countries working together for regional peace and security and prosperity. Uh, and so that was something. So I think that he had it a little bit backwards here. I would say uh, the Abraham Accords is the pinnacle. Recognition of uh, the Golan Heights is nice, but it was like, where have you been all these years? And I did it because of a lot of reasons. Uh, Israel has to do what they have to do, but we have to get to peace because the world is turning and it's not a good thing for Israel. What's happening is not a good thing. I want to show. I don't know what that means exactly. Israel's at war because the jihad is at war with, is with Israel. It's not something that you choose. It's not like I woke up in the morning and I want to have peace. I don't want to have peace. We have enemies. We have enemies. We have to fight them. That's the reality. It's, it's, it's just the way it is. It's not something that I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's just get over this little war thing. It doesn't work that way. I got people who want to make war on me, and they've done a great job at, 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 at rousing their troops and creating the ideology of jihadism, Nazism, okay? That's my situation, President Trump. So it's not like I can just get over it and just go to the next phase. It's just not like that. We got jihad in the north with, with 250,000 uh, rockets, that's Hezbollah, we got Hamas, we got Iran going for the nuke, we got all kinds of problems. So it's not going to turn on, on one second just because it doesn't look good for the world right now, because it's not cool, it's not trending on TikTok. We got enemies, we got to defend our peoplehood, we got to defend our land, we got to rid the land of jihadism. So let's not just like, let's not just like kind of like, you know, wave it away with, with, um, with, a, with a wave of the hand. It's not going to work that way. We got to fight our enemies and we need a deep breath to have patience, to destroy our enemies, to assert sovereignty on our land. And that's another thing that never happened under Trump, which would almost happen, but it didn't happen. And that is Israeli sovereignty, starting at least with the Jordan Valley, but really on all of the land of Israel, Israel should be sovereign. 
with you a question that in our minds, every leader in the world should reply. How would you react if, God forbid, it was your children or grandchildren who were kidnapped by Hamas or suffering the horrors that so many Israelis were going through on October 7? On October 7? Uh, I would say I would act very much the same way as you did. I'd have to be crazy not to. Only a fool would not do that. That was a horrible attack. But it was a, an attack that I blame on Biden because they have no respect for him. He can't put two sentences together. He can't talk. He's when he says that they don't have respect for him, what he means is the Arab world, the jihad. Uh, of course, they don't have respect for him. He pays them off and he doesn't seem like a strong leader. Now, from here on, you're going to hear President Trump talk in a derogatory manner against President Biden. Look, I'm coming here as an Israeli. I'm here to talk about what's good for uh, the Israeli future, the Jewish future in the land of Israel. I'm not here to diss one president or another. I, I'm, I am very willing to say that President Biden uh, empowers the enemies of Israel, and he's what I call today an Israel shrinker. He's interested in shrinking Israel. Uh, that's for sure. But if he's dumb or not dumb, I basically don't believe uh, that people get to these uh, places in their careers by being dumb. They have to be smart in some way. Uh, and that's just also the posture that I take vis-a-vis -vis people who I deem to be dangerous to me. I like to take them seriously. So I'm not going to be party to the ideas that President Biden is dumb because I actually think he's quite smart. Uh, uh, where he is in his age and all that kind of stuff, that's really not my business. My point is I take my enemy seriously. For President Trump, maybe it's good for him to kind of, uh, you know, look down on, on President Biden and, and minimize him. But from my point of view, the danger of President Biden and his team is very serious, and I take them very seriously. He's a very dumb person. He's a dumb person. We see, changing now to economy issues, uh, we see a rise of inflation actually all over the world, especially in the last two years since the war in Ukraine and then now the war in Israel, including the uh, uh, Suez Canal, which is actually close to the right. to international uh, trade. Um, uh, just to correct here, the Suez Canal is not close to international trade. It's, it's the um, uh, uh, Bab el Mandab Strait, which is controlled by Yemen, Right, and Yemen is right there, basically, and you've got these Houthis, and they're the ones that are threatening, not closing, threatening uh, a global trade because they've slowed down traffic through the Bab el-Mandab Strait, which leads to the Suez Canal. Bottom line is uh, the, the international community and Israel has not taken care of this threat. Let's see what President Trump answers. How do you see the world coming out of this, of this crisis? I mean, shouldn't we, do, do not we need strong America to stop all this mess around the world? The problem with the world. Before we even hear the answer there, do we need a strong America? I think I, I can understand that. I can understand why an Israeli uh, journalist would ask that. But my question is, do we not need a strong Israel? Imagine a strong Israel patrolling these waters, maybe together with an ally like India, making sure that these waters are safe for international trade. I'm a little bit tired of us uh, uh, putting our hopes and our security in the hands of somebody else. Israel should be patrolling these waters. Israel should be smashing the Houthis. Israel should make sure that the, uh, uh, the Persian Gulf is safe uh, for all shipping uh, and that not threatened by the Iranians. I just believe that it's time for Israel, in a, power in a world with a power vacuum, we should be standing up and being bigger and stronger right now with the help of God, of course. The world today is Trump isn't president of the United States. If Trump were president of the United States, there'd be no problem with China and Taiwan. There'd be no problem with... Israel being attacked on October 7th, and Ukraine would have never happened. The attack on Ukraine would have never happened. That would have never happened with Putin for two reasons. Number one, he wouldn't have done it if I were president. We used to talk about it. He would never have done it. And very importantly, oil prices were much lower. By the way, you have any plans to visit Israel in the coming oh, I future? I know. I, I've loved it. I've been treated very good there. They say if I ran for, if I ran for office in Israel, I'd get 98% of the vote. All right, so let's just say that uh, would have October 7th happened uh, with President Trump in the White House? I'm guessing that he's right, that it wouldn't have happened. I think that they waited for the opportune moment uh, of President Biden presidency, both financially and in terms of political clout and support. So I personally think that he's right, that they waited and they wouldn't have done it uh, under a President Trump. They would have waited for President Biden. That's what happened. 
with regarding to the next question of the invitation, you know, you're always invited to come to the Holy Land, come to Israel, come to the God of Israel, come to Jerusalem, come to Tel Aviv. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that's the real concern. I think the concern is uh, a, gl a globe that is right now off kilter. I mean, the powers today is the Iran, China, Russia, North Korea axis, not exactly an axis of morality. Uh, is America going to fill that void? I don't know. But as I always say to you, and I said before, uh, it's Israel that has to step up to at least fulfill its role, at least regionally, if not even more than that. But certainly regionally, we should be the power broker uh, of defense, uh, of economy, and of spirituality, uh, as I like to call it, the spiritual capital of the world. Let's go on. I'm not Jewish, and yet Israel to me is very important. That's why I did Golan Heights. Golan Heights is worth trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars. I called in our ambassador, David Friedman. I said, give me a little bit of a, a lesson, a history lesson on Golan Heights, five minutes or less, if possible. And he did. He gave me a very good, quick history lesson. And I made a decision. I gave you something that nobody else would have given you. But I mean, that shows you the power of an ambassador. Give your president a five-minute talk, and he's going to make decisions of, of global import and relevance, right? It's like, it's a little bit scary, right? It's like, give me a five minute talk and then I'll make a decision, you know, about the future of a whole country there. Uh, of course, as I said before, Israel had recognized the Golan Heights by itself uh, a long time ago, um, I think 1982. Uh, but okay, President Trump recognized it as well. But uh, as, as the video shows, David Friedman had a big hand in that. The biggest thing I gave, look, I gave the capital of Israel and the the whole thing with the embassy, which created the capital in a sense. No, 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 no. It did not create the capital. I love you, President Trump. God bless you. But you did not create Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That was done about 3,000 years ago by King David. So that's very important there. Then it was it became the first temple under King Solomon. Later on became the second temple under Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah and the Maccabees. Uh, so we had two temples and two capitals in Jerusalem. Then the state of Israel fought uh, against six Arab countries and uh, liberated Jerusalem, established their third Commonwealth capital there. So America's recognition under President Trump uh, of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is mucho grande important, okay? I love it. It was important, but let's not say that that created the capital of Israel. You know, let's just let's just keep it in proportion here. The, the capital of Israel was before America and probably will last after America as well. Mentioning Ambassador Friedman, he just presented a new plan. I don't know if you saw it, um, suggesting that uh, the United States will recognize Israel's sovereignty over the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, the way it's called. Would you support such a plan? Well, they want to show it to me. They want to discuss it. I'm going to take a look at it. Look, I've been uh, doing a lot of things for Israel that's what's good for Israel. But I also want peace. I want to see peace like everyone else. You want to see peace, too. Yeah, I want to see peace, but not at all costs. I want to see peace, but not sell us out. I want to see peace through the destruction of the enemies of Israel. I want to see peace that's going to be good for the region and not giving into Iran and other forms of jihadism that suppress the, the peoples of this region. I think that talking too much about peace is not right. You got to say right now it's a time of conflict. It's a time to push back, to erase, to clean house. Later on, uh, we'll start having peace. And of course, I do give, again, President Trump the credit for the Abraham Accords, which was a real movement towards recognition of Israel and through that regional peace. But they do want to show that to me, so they'll be doing that. Would you like to send any message to the people of Israel who is, are now in one of the most difficult times the country has experienced? I would send a message. I would send a message, and I'll start off by saying I was the best president in the history of Israel, but there was never been a president, and mostly anybody, whether it's a president or not, nobody did for Israel what I did for Israel, including defense, including billions and billions of dollars a year, four billion dollars a year for years when other people wanted to cut it off. But I will say that uh, Israel's in trouble. All right, so just to be fair here, President Obama, who's no great friend of Israel, also wanted to send money to Israel and, uh, and sign on the uh, Memorandum of Understanding. The, the thing is that American aid is really not aid. It's joint defense development. It's very important to understand that. It is really money that a lot, most of it goes back to the United States, but basically develops joint munitions, joint arms, 
joint development. That's number one. Number two is what we see now is that Israeli dependence on the United States uh, is a strategic danger because if the United States wants to cut it off or take all the munitions and send it to Ukraine or whatever they want to do, if we are out of our own ability to either make arms, make jets, et cetera, uh, then that weakens us strategically. Moreover, it's not just about manufacturing. It's also about the ability to purchase weapons and weapon systems from other countries. And the United States blocks that. And I think it's important for Israel to diversify, to be able to have a, a, a purchase partnership with India, with China, with Russia, with whoever, so that we're not solely dependent. We are a country that's oftentimes in danger. And therefore, we cannot allow ourselves to be completely dependent on one country, even if it's an ally to the United States. Because sometimes that ally doesn't exactly act like an ally. Right now, the United States is trying to shrink Israel. And that's not exactly an ally. And they're gonna, they want to weaken us. They want to weaken our battles even at Shifa Hospital. That's what generals are telling me. So therefore, it is a, it, it, giving money to Israel is good. Let's not exaggerate the case. $3 billion, $4 billion is a drop in the bucket in Israel's $500 billion GDP, a yearly GDP. So that's, a, that's important to remember that. But the point is, is that the future of the U.S.-Israel relationship is, is a, an, an, an alliance, but not a dependence. That has to be stopped, and I think October 7th has taught us that. Trouble right now, it's a troubled, it's a very troubled place. Uh, an attack happened that should have never been allowed to happen, both from the Israeli standpoint and from the United States standpoint. Uh, if they respected our president, which they don't, they have no respect for him whatsoever, that attack would not have happened. That's why it wouldn't have happened with me. But I say just be strong, be smart, and uh, let's get this over with. And when it's over with, you're going to be back to having a great life. Look, I know Israel very well. I spent a lot of time there, and I have a lot of friends there, a tremendous number of friends there. They're incredible people. It's an incredible place. Uh, you want the fighting to stop, everybody does. You have to finish up, but you want this, you gotta get, you gotta get back to having that country again the way it was. Uh, so sad that. Having the country the way it was means not giving away our land to the jihad. And the United States is one of the main culprits in Israel being in this mess today. Our defense situation is in many respects a, a direct result of listening to American foreign policy. If it's the Oslo Accords and the two-state solution, if it's the disengagement in 2005 giving away Gaza to the Hamas, if it's allowing, uh, if it's not first striking Hezbollah and not, not taking care of business. So... Let's not like sweep it all under the rug. The United States is at fault for much of Israel's strategic uh, uh, troubles. And so I would say, President Trump, before you rush to make sure that we go back on the track of peace, you got to clean up your mess. You got to let us clean up around here and be the regional power and smash all those enemies from within and from without that have been empowered by the United States. Let's be real. Let's not like BS the whole thing. Let's call a spade a spade. The United States is at fault for much of the bad policy around here. And Israelis, of course, who accept that, uh, that dicta, dictate. We can't have that. Things have got to change. President Trump, let's not rush to make peace when there's still cleanup that has to be done. This could have happened. The, the date of October 7th is going to go down. It's just, just a terrible, what a terrible thing to happen. And it bothers me so much when I see people, they don't talk about October 7th anymore. They talk about how aggressive Israel is. And uh, it, it's amazing that they're not talking about October 7th. And well, why don't they talk about it? They that? don't want to talk about it. When I talk about it, people don't want to hear about it. You know, they, you have... You have a Let's be straight here. The reason that people don't want to hear about October 7th is because China, Russia, and others, and, and the pro-Jihad axis, they're fixated on the, the response part, Israel's strong response. And they have conveniently erased the reason for the strong response. That is uh, a great narrative attack on Israel that focuses in on the response. Uh, and you've got to, people like you, President Trump, have got to make it clear Israel's fighting not just for October 7th. They're fighting an entrenched jihad that wants to destroy Israel. And they have every, not just right, every need 
to smash those enemies. And that goes back to the same thing that we said before. Don't try to overcome that. Don't try to rush it and say, let's get to peace. We got to make sure that it's clear to the world. There are bad guys. And, and most, most, most important is clear to ourselves, right? Before we even try to uh, get the world to buy into what we're saying, we got to make it clear to ourselves. There's no end to this war until its goals are achieved. And that is not just getting rid of Hamas. It's smashing jihadism and with the help of God, retaking full sovereignty over the land of Israel. A lot, you have a lot of people on the outside that are not friendly to Israel and they're never gonna be friendly to Israel. And you have to be very careful. You're in a very treacherous, you know, we call it a neighborhood that's a little on the dangerous side, right? You're in a very dangerous neighborhood. And with Iran getting a nuclear weapon, once they have a nuclear weapon, uh, you'll be speaking to them a lot differently than you're speaking right now. They would have never had a nuclear weapon with me. They understood that. They would never have And had. they will not have a nuclear weapon with you, if you again, if you are reelected. They will never have a nuclear weapon, no. But you have a long time to go. They could have a nuclear weapon in 35 days. Ouch. That's, that's a statement that I wouldn't doubt has some serious facts behind it. And again, it's American policy, American presidential policy under the Obama years and the Biden years, which has allowed Iran to become stronger and to be able to build up to this nuclear bomb. And uh, it's also American policy that has weakened Israeli response. And it's time to make sure that this doesn't go any further. And that's a hint to Israeli leadership, which is don't waste time succumbing to American diktat that's telling you not to act. You got to act strong right now and defend the Jewish people from this scourge. I have seven months to go and nine months to take office. A lot of bad things can happen in that. You know, that's a very, that's a lot. That's like an eternity. Seven months in this world and especially in the Middle East where it's so, it's so combative and so combustible. And uh, this would be a time, if we had a, a real president, if we had a president that knew what he was doing, that could put two sentences together, yeah, that could get solved very quickly. The stepdaughter, if I'm not. Maybe, but the point, you said two different things, which is if you had a president, it would be solved quickly, but there's many months till that, and, and if. And so Israel's got to defend itself and protect its interests and not waste time waiting for the right president. We've got to act strong now and show the jihad who is the boss around here, who is the balabayit, who is that, that's in Hebrew, uh, for who's, who's the, who's the uh, owner of the house. Uh, who's who's going to govern around here and make sure that bad guys don't get out of control? Wrong of Kamala Harris uh, raised money for UNRWA. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think that means you should never vote for them. How could a Jewish person vote for Kamala Harris? And uh, essentially, you know, that's what probably is going to happen. Because you look at this guy, he can't walk down a flight of stairs. He can't walk across a room. He can't find the exit to a stage where they have five different sets of stairs. Uh, you might have Kamala Harris if this doesn't work out. You have her right now. If something happened to him, you have her. And that's right, she supports the enemy. But he supports the enemy too. Remember this, I leave it with this. I think that's very true. Uh, uh, he supports the enemy. And I, I, can't, uh, I can't disagree. I think that Jewish people who love Israel or are pro-Israel who still think that it's a better idea to vote for Biden are misguided. And I say that lovingly. Uh, again, I, I think that people should, you know, American Jews should consider buying a home here in Israel and moving here to Israel and sending their kids here to Israel. Uh, and that's more important than who you're voting for. But at the end, don't vote for your countries for even if you don't live in Israel, if you love Israel, don't vote, don't vote for our enemies because uh, the President Bidens of this world empower our enemies. And so if you empower Biden, you're empowering our enemies. I'm sorry. That's, that's just the truth. Uh, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings and I'm not trying to be like, like partisan political. It's not an issue of Democrat versus Republican. It's just a simple fact that the Biden administration sends money to Iran and the Trump administration blocked money to Iran. That's, that's just that simple. And so if you are concerned about the future of the Jewish people and don't want to make, don't want to see a genocide because these people, the Hamas and their ilk have proven that they would, if they could do a genocide, they would, if they could. And I think also it's important to talk about the other side which is the Abraham Accords. We could have a totally different way of doing things around here, which is a strong Israel, just awesome, with strong Arab countries, really like, like there could be a vision for an alternative here. It's not just about hate of the Arabs, God forbid, but it is about 
the fight against the jihad, which wants to destroy Israel, and then to liberate the people, liberate the people of Iran, so many of whom don't want this garbage. If Biden was for Israel, October 7th would have never happened, and it did happen, and probably the most tragic day in the history of Israel, one of the most tragic days of, in the history of any country, but he, this should never have happened. It shouldn't have happened from the Israeli standpoint. It shouldn't have happened from the United States. United States, if they respected our president, it would have never, ever happened. Thank you Mr. Very President, much. thank you very much thank for you. this interview. Thank you yeah. both. All right, so thank you very much to President Trump. That is important stuff. Uh, Israel's got to be strong. That's really one of the most important things that, that has to be understood, even from this interview. Sure, you know, it, it would be great if there was an America that, that's making good policy and fighting against bad guys in this world, but Israel needs its independence. Israel doesn't need to rush to peace, but needs to fight its war properly until it takes care of business. And we also need to get back to our inner identity, our core identity, uh, which is tied into the land of Israel, which is tied into the Bible, which is tied into Hebrew and Judaism, uh, and we have to uh, have relationship with the world, but at the same time, we got to stand alone when it comes to policy. Make sure that the policies uh, are good for Israel. I want to thank you guys so much uh, for being with me. Check out more of my stuff at uh, this channel, Ishai Fleischer TV. Subscribe, you know, hit the bell, the whole thing. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, and also connect to us in many different ways at YishaiFleischer.com uh, and support us uh, at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that segment uh, with, uh, with uh, the Trump interview with Israel Hayom. It was important. And uh, Malka, before uh, we go, we have two more things that we got to talk about. Yes. First, we're going to have a segment with, in the second, we're going to have a segment, segment with Ben Bresky. Great. But before that, let's talk a little bit about the Torah portion. Okay. There's something that you said that is so important. I try. You said turning over for Pesach. Ah. Uh. It's that season. Oh, it's the season. Boy, is it. And the Torah portion is a very important Torah portion because it talks about uh, kashrut. It talks yeah. about kosher food. Right. Kosher food is biblical. Right. Very much. Uh, right. It is totally biblical. Right. People don't know that. Yeah. Kosher food is biblical. And this week's Torah portion tells us which animals we're allowed to eat, which not. Right. What are, what are the kosher mammals? What are the kosher birds? Lizards? Don't eat lizards. Don't eat those. Don't eat, don't eat all kinds of birds. Don't eat, uh, bunnies? Don't eat, don't eat bunnies. Don't Squirrels. eat camels, right? Don't eat, don't eat pig. Right. Don't eat pig. The, the, the Bible defines it so, so clearly. I'm amazed sometimes that people who love the Bible. Don't eat sharks. Right. Don't eat shrimp. And people, I'm just like sometimes amazed. I'm like, the Bible lays it out to you. Don't you want to live like, God, like, like God's word? Don't you, don't you want to... Um, to, right, do what he likes. Right, don't, don't. Wow, like what a gift! Yeah, what a gift! God's like, I want to tell you what's good for you, and what keeps you close to me. And for us Jewish people, it's like, what makes you eternal? What makes you an eternal people? How do you, how to stay connected to me? And it's just so important. And I think I think you know, it's a, it's like it's like you can hear God's word telling you what not to eat, what to eat? He created the world. Do you really think that a new text came around and was like, don't worry about it? Do you think God was like, that thing I said before about what's good for you to eat, no worries. Forget it. It's well, Google not important. does that all the time, Ishai. What do you mean? You know, one day it's like, you should not eat butter. Then it's like, you know what you should totally do? Eat butter. Yeah, you know what the difference is? One is Google, one is God. That's right. And it's like, God does not, he does not change his mind when he reveals to you the secrets of this universe. Right, he's not trendy. Right. Maybe, I hope he will be trendy forever. No, he is cool. Right. He's not, God is trendy. He's timeless. Oh my God. He's a classic. God is like, so cool right now. Anyway, I'm just saying what, like, and I, I want to say that like, uh, in our, in our home life, in our family life. Yes. Kashrut, kosher yeah. eating, is, is one of the main things keeping meat separate from milk. Can I tell you a funny kosher thing that happened to me and, today? And like, I saw you just the other day bringing back the old box of matzahs, and that's, of course, yes. before I bake the, the, the matzahs. Yes, you're going to bake the handmade matzahs, but I buy the, the machine matzahs because those travel well, and yeah. they're nice and crunchy. And they're good, too. Yeah, yeah. they're very good, and I yeah. like them. But I had like a funny, not funny kosher experience today. Okay. So today I went, uh, I made a special trip to the grocery store, even though I was at the grocery store already this week for our Shabbat food and 
weekly food. I made a special trip to the grocery store today because um, there is a Iran is threatening to attack Israel. Um, and there has been a lot of speculation that Iran will attempt to hit um, our major infrastructure targets and take out um, water systems and electricity systems. There's there's anyway, it's a rumor. There's nothing confirmed. There's rumors like that. So today I went to the grocery store and I was in a dilemma because I wanted to buy extra food in case, God forbid, there would be a security event like that. Right. But you want to stock Pesach up. is coming. Right. Oh, right. Oh, oh, oh. I wanted to stock up, but Pesach is coming. Yeah. So I was just like, and so I was like, what am I going to do? Like, should I buy foods that are like just sh- shelf stable, good foods that and I can, you know, sell the chametz? Or should I buy like all kosher le Pesach stuff? And should I buy kosher le Pesach stuff that I could eat on Pesach, i.e. non-kidney oat food? Or should I buy foods that also have kidney oat, which you're allowed to own, like uh, legumes, legume things, which Ashkenazi Jews do not eat on Pesach? Oh my gosh, you just got into the weeds. Yeah, the, this is a lot of kosh. I'm just giving you like a, a glimpse into the life, okay? So I was like, so I, de- so I decided that I would buy kidney oat food and we will put it away on a shelf and you can keep you can own it without selling it on passover but you're not supposed to use it if you're ashkenazi jew and i did buy the matzah zisha and the reason i bought the matzahs like three weeks early was literally because of the security situation because i knew that pesach is coming and come heck or high water we are having are matzahs on Pesach. That's right. Basically, like if, if, Iran can be blowing up stuff all around and we are going to be eating some matzah up in this Pesach because that is what the Jews do. That is how we keep kosher on Pesach. Lashana haba Tehran. Okay, we're right. going to, we, they're not going <laughs> to And I bought grape nothing. juice. I yeah. bought also, you know, in Israel, I don't know if they do this in an outside of Israel, but they sell in jars, little jars of haroset. Now it is not the recipe I would use, which is just apples and sugar and sweet wine and walnuts ground up walnuts it's like the Sephardi recipe which has like dates in it and stuff like that right but nonetheless more, i bought it's more mortary yeah it's very i mean that would do to put some you know bricks together yeah that is would be made way more effective than my squishy apple one but anyway i bought a little jar of harosik because i was just like i don't even know what will be by the time setter comes and what if I can't get apples and what if I can't get walnuts? So can, we can have haroset. That's my story. That's okay. my kashrut. That's my funny, not funny kashrut yeah. story. No, food is big. And and, yeah. and this week I was really learning that, that, that we really should eat <clears throat> for the sake of serving God and to keep our bodies going and to, and to not overly indulge in the delights of food. And I've noticed recently that food is is very pervasive. I know that sounds very obvious, but it's like everywhere and all the time. You're always thinking about food, and and the Torah is there to tell you like you cannot have everything you want. You cannot have you cannot you cannot have you know relations with anybody you want. You cannot eat whatever you want. You have to watch. You out. can't you hit think somebody about just because you want to. That's right. That's right. You can't be violent whenever you want. Very good point. You you've got to control the urges, and and not only that, God's like I, I here's here's a system. And and some some young Israeli guy was was asking me, does God really care? And I just said to him about what about kosher food. Mm-hmm. And I just said to him, do you believe this was a question that I had my whole childhood? Right. right. It happens to be that my grandfather, Alava Shalom, was a Holocaust survivor, and he survived. It's a it's a very beautiful story, the the story of his survival. But the first food that they gave him when he was rescued from the camps was bacon. Which is not turkey bacon, okay? Not lamb bacon. Not lamb bacon, that's right. Nice pork bacon, right? And he was saved by this. And so my whole childhood, uh, growing up not religious, it was a question mark to me. How can it be that God cares about kosher food when when I'm alive because of not kosher food? Right. And it took some, some maturing and some learning in order to understand... That God does care about the kosher food, right? And that that if you want to, if we want me to really blow your mind, that that bacon that he ate was his kosher food. Mm-hmm. 
to because survive. the Torah wants you to eat non-kosher food in order to survive. Right. And that food that saved his life was his kosher food. Very good. Yeah. Okay, Malka Fleischer, I want to wish you great preparation for, for Pesach. Uh, it's really coming down. And there's, we, we you know, behold, Dor Vadorum, Dimaleno, Chalotein, every generation, they stand against us to destroy the Jewish people. And there's really a feeling of that right now. Uh, and uh, we need God's blessings and we need to be strong at the same time. We have to listen to God uh, and be strong. Yep. Against our enemies. Uh, and fight them uh, and without without any without any mercy on the evil of this world. Um, and oh, have Hashem sinura. That's right. Oh, lovers, lovers of, of God. God hate evil. That's right. Uh, and I want to. I'm very excited for this Pesach season. And, and I want everybody to to learn the chapters uh, of of the Book of Leviticus about kashrut. And this is also true about non Jews. Non Jews should consider like, do you really want to eat that stuff? Do you want to eat that stuff? And I say this, of course, as a as a as a friend, and not as and not as chastisement. Right, not in judgment. Not yeah, in judgment. It's your way. decision. It's your decision. But but the Torah does lay out to us how to get closer to Him and how to keep ourselves from energies. And and that's my that was what I said to this young young non religious kid. I said, Do you believe that there's wisdom of food? Is there wisdom in how to eat properly? Yeah. So that's one of the things. What everybody, do you say? I said to him. Wait a minute. Oh. I said to him. I said to him. Isn't this something that we discuss constantly? So wouldn't you think that maybe the Torah is like, let me give you some wisdom of food? Like people want to know the wisdom of food. So the Torah has got wisdom of food. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Think about wisdom of food. Right, spiritual wisdom Spir- of food. Spiritual wisdom of food. Maybe not just spiritual, maybe physical as well. All right, folks. Uh, thank you so much. But before we go, let's find out about one person who chose to make a Jewish life after being the first American consul to Jerusalem in the 1800s wow. ended up converting to, to Judaism. Wow. Uh, his name is Warden Cresson. I have never heard this name. And the great intrepid Ben Bresky will now teach us a little bit about the life and times of Warden Cresson. Ben Bresky, take it away. This is a moment in Jewish history. Warder Cresson was the first American consul to Jerusalem. It was a position he held for a little over a week. You see, Warder Cresson was accused of being an unstable Christian missionary. He did go through several religious phases, but once he settled in Jerusalem, Warder Cresson settled on Judaism. After his conversion, he faced trial for insanity, which he successfully defended, proving that converting to Judaism does not make one crazy. In his autobiographical book, The Key of David, published in 1852, Cresson argues for Judaism and advocates for Jewish people to be repatriated to the land of Israel and build agricultural communities. The introduction to his book reads as follows. In the spring of 1844, I left everything near and dear to me on earth. I left the wife of my youth and six lovely children, dearer to me than my natural life, and an excellent farm, with everything comfortable around me. I left all these in pursuit of truth, and for the sake of truth alone. I had often from my youth asked my soul, where is perfect, incontestable truth to be found? The answer was, it exists everywhere. It is in the heart. It consists in the conscious evidence of her existence, against which no reasoning can prevail. Still, I was not satisfied. Warder Cresson was born in 1799 to a prominent Philadelphia Quaker family, one of eight children. He was successful in agriculture, married and had several children. He purchased a large amount of farmland in the Philadelphia area. During this period of American history, there was a great amount of religious and political discourse. There was the controversy within the Quaker community, and Warder Cresson was one of the many Quakers who began debating religious beliefs. He published a pamphlet criticizing his religious leaders and debated with his fellow Quakers. By 1833, he had several more children and written several more religious pamphlets. While he had become estranged from his former Quaker community, his wife was intent on continuing her affiliation. It was this year that Cresson wrote The Jews and the Mosaic Law, which explains Judaism to both Jewish and Christian readers. In it, he wrote about, quote, the ultimate restoration of the Israelites and the ingathering of the captives. 
During this time, he befriended Isaac Leeser of Congregation Mikvah Israel, a prominent synagogue in Philadelphia, and he read Leeser's monthly periodical, The Occident. Later, when Cresson converted to Judaism, he wrote articles for it under his new name, Michael Boaz Israel. But before we get there, we must discuss the shortest ever appointment of an American consul abroad. This took place in 1844, when Water Crescent successfully lobbied to become the first United States consul to Jerusalem, which was then part of the Ottoman Empire. Congressman Edward Joy Morris, later American minister to Turkey, recommended Cresson. Cresson offered to serve as consul for no salary, and he used his personal fortune to pay for the trip. Barely a week later, Samuel D. Ingham of Pennsylvania, a former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, wrote to Calhoun the following. His mania is of the religious species. He was born a Quaker and wanted to be a preacher. His passion is for religious controversy, and no doubt he expects to convert to Jews and Mohammedans in the East. But in truth, he is withal a very weak-minded man in his mind. While Cresson was busy traveling to the land of Israel, he was removed from his position by the Secretary of State. Ironically, while he was suspected of being a Christian missionary, it was the presence of Christian missionaries in Jerusalem that greatly turned him off. He complains that in Jerusalem he found, quote, missionaries to the Holy Land with above enormous salaries, varying from 100 to 1,200 pounds sterling, not to convert, but to pervert the Jews, that is, to gentilize them. But they have never succeeded in ever getting a single Jew born in Jerusalem to apostatize, but only a very few poor, miserable stragglers, and even these were only brought by having seen their English gold shining and tempting them through their sawdust. These missionaries, immediately upon their arrival in Jerusalem, hired the very best houses, bought the very best and most splendid Arabian horses, and dressed and lived in the most luxurious and stylish manner, according as their different salaries permitted them." Cresson spent four years in Jerusalem and, in some capacity, acted as an official consul until officials contacted him to officially inform him that he had been stripped of his duties. Among those that Cresson met in Jerusalem was the famous English novelist William Makepeace Thackeray, author of Vanity Fair and The Luck of Barry Lyndon. He described Cresson as a tradesman who made a considerable fortune and lived in a country house in comfortable retirement to witness the return of the Jews and the glorification of the restored Jerusalem. He sent and demanded an interview with the Pasha and explained to him the infallible return of the Jews to Palestine. Another famous author whom Cresson met in Jerusalem was Herman Melville, author of Moby Dick. He, too, was taken with the idea of the Jewish people becoming self-sufficient and self-governing in the land of Israel. However, once there, Herman Melville wrote in his journal, The idea of making farmers of the Jews is in vain. In the first place, Judea is a desert with few exceptions. In the second place, the Jews hate farming. All who cultivate the soil in Palestine are Arabs. The Jews dare not live outside walled towns of villages for fear of the malicious persecution of Arabs and Turks. Besides, the number of Jews in Palestine is comparatively small. And how are the hosts of them scattered in other lands to be brought here? Only by a miracle. Ironically, Melville was proven wrong, and the Zionist movement, which had then just begun, created numerous farms and agricultural communities in the land of Israel. Some would interpret it as a miracle. Warder Cresson was one of those who initiated such a farm, but, as we will find later, it never came to fruition. Yet Herman Melville still wrote his famous epic poem, Clarel, A Poem and Pilgrimage in the Holy Land. This was published in 1876, and many believe that the main character, an American farmer who converts to Judaism after moving to the Holy Land, is based on Warder Cresson. Warder Cresson marveled at the sights described in the Bible he now saw with his own eyes. He writes, quote, I remained in Jerusalem in my former faith until the 28th day of March, 1848, when I became fully satisfied that I could never obtain strength and rest but by doing as Ruth did, and saying to her mother-in-law Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. In short, I was circumcised, entered the Holy Covenant, and became a Jew." 
After four years in Jerusalem, Cresson returned to Philadelphia, eager to share his newfound faith with his wife and children. But his wife had become, as he put it, quote, a rigid Episcopalian, unquote. He claimed that his wife's convictions were one of the great points upon which first commenced our difficulties. It forced him to choose between God or my wife. To this were added financial problems. His farm was sold, and $2,000 worth of his personal effects were disposed of. Crescent had given his wife power of attorney before leaving for Jerusalem, and now he found himself practically propertyless. Thus began the trial for lunacy in Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. Warder Crescent's soon-to-be ex-wife and several members of his family said that he was a lunatic. Well-known lawyers represented both sides. Newspapers noted that a large number of his friends testified that they'd had dealings with him and always considered him of sane mind, and that his farm was well attended to. The following news articles were published during and after the trial. From the New York Times. The friends and family of Warder Crescent Esquire, late consul at Jerusalem, are applying for a writ to shut him out of his possession for part of his property, on the ground of him being a lunatic for embracing Judaism. Mr. Crescent had a deed of trust for half his property, but was not so insane as to convey the other half, so they wish to obtain that under this writ. That a Christian court would decide that adopting Judaism as a religion would be proof of insanity we can never believe. It would be an attack on the founder of Christianity himself. It would be incompatible with reason and common sense. We know the history of Mr. Cresson and believe him to be sincere in his new faith. If he is crazy on that account, what is to be the condition of the whole Gentile world at this promised time? We must be careful how we allow such writs of inquiry to undermine civil and religious rights of citizens. From the Philadelphia Herald. Water Crescent was discharged on Monday by a jury's verdict from all imputation of insanity. This gentleman, it is now well known, has become a member of the Jewish persuasion. In 1844, he was appointed U.S. Consul at Jerusalem, where he proceeded and amid the scenes of Palestine, he became a convert to that old and venerable faith, which was founded by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and confirmed and established by the divine legation and miracles of Moses. Mr. Cresson returned to his country in 1848, and finding he could not conciliate his belief with that of his family, he generously divided his property with them by a deed of trust, and became an exile from all he held dear and loved. The sacrifice was great, but his conscience was supreme. He was soon after prosecuted by his family for lunacy, but the jury, after an important investigation of six days, liberated him from his thraldom, pronounced him sane, and capable of conducting and managing his worldly affairs. This prosecution was an attempt to coerce conscience through the horrors of a lunatic asylum and deprive a man of his civil and religious liberty and throw an imputation on the Jewish faith. But the jury, with magnanimity, for they were all Christians, that does them high honor, vindicated the truth of the American rights and our Republican Constitution. Now that the charges were dismissed, Water Crescent, now Michael Boaz Israel, returned to Jerusalem. There he married a Sephardic Jewish woman, Rachel Molino, with whom he had two children. He published in 1851 a pamphlet called The Great Restoration and Consolidation of Israel in Palestine, addressing it to the Jews of the House of Israel scattered throughout the United States of America, England, and all of Europe. He suggested the formation of a great American and foreign association for colonization and promoting the welfare of the interests of the Jewish people. He also had an idea to establish a large farm just outside Jerusalem in the Valley of Rephaim, Emek Rephaim. Today, Emek Rephaim is a major street in Jerusalem. It continues all the way past Malchamal. You can see large tracts of empty land there today in between the old train tracks, the mall, and the zoo. Perhaps this was the very area where Warder Crescent envisioned a farm. Warder Crescent died in 1860 and was buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. This has been a moment in Jewish history. 
Thank you to Yishai Fleischer. Thank you to all the listeners, and Shalom. All right. That was Ben Bresky's awesomeness. People love that segment. People love Malka Fleisch on the show. People love Ben Bresky on the show. People love you on the show, Ishai. That's true. Thank Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for the, for, the, for the joy and the strength and the time to <laughs> broadcast uh, to the folks around the world that love Israel. I want to thank you, Chavit Seidman, Moshe Herman, Ben Bresky, Tabitha, and Lou when we're live for helping us get out to the world. Um, Lots of great folks are involved in this project. You can too by just going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai and being part of the program. And thank you to all those who support. Next week, I'll do my best to try to also read some of the many emails that I've received recently. Much appreciated. Stay tuned. Stay strong. Stay connected. Stay part of the story. God bless you wherever you are. Get strength from the Torah, from the good people uh, that are out there. From each other. From the folks that are fighting. Right now is the time to stand up and be doubly as strong. Right. Nobody can bring us down. We've got to send that truth out to the world. We've got to broadcast the truth and the strength and the eternity of Israel and push back on all those lies that threaten to wash the brains of all the young people in this world, to turn them into haters of Israel, which means haters of God. They don't even know it. And therefore, we have to be doubly as loud right now. Send out that signal. You be broadcasters. And, and God, God bless you. And I'll be behind you just like you're behind me. More great stuff is on the way. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.